Okay, so now we know that uh, we needed, we had light acting as both a wave, particle, matter acting as a particle and a wave. Well, the equation of motion that we use for classical physics, like I just showed, is um, Newton's second law, and it yields a precise knowledge of the position and the momentum, because again, momentum is P is equal to mv. Okay, so keep in mind that the momentum is what we're going to be talking about. So we've got uh, momentum and position. Okay, so now we're going to get into, um, well, we'll just start with postulating. So you all know that electrons behave in these discrete energy states. So if you have energy state one, so there's your electron in a ground state energy. If it's excited to a higher state energy, it's going to come up here by accepting a photon with energy equal to h nu. It jumps up to that excited state, and then it decays back down. And when it does decay back down, it releases a photon. Again, equal to some energy h nu. The kicker here is that those quantized energy states, you can't have an electron exist in an energy state in between. Classical physics says the electron can exist anywhere in between. We know that it can't. Um, and we're very happy with this. We've drawn these pictures for a lot of years now. Spin up, spin down. You don't have spin up, spin up, spin up, spin up, spin up. All of these electrons occupying the exact same energy space, and you don't have them occupying the energy space between S1 and S2, S3, and so on. They can only be in these discrete packets. Problem. What's the math that gives you answers that are only this value, this value, and this value, and nothing in between? Newton's laws are based off calculus, and calculus is all about these continuous functions. So if you have some function, so if some function of x goes up in some sort of polynomial, you all know that if there's a break, there's no, it's not a function. That there's something, you can't have a function that doesn't exist. So let's say this is x equals 10. And for some reason, nature says, nope, if x equals 10, that function no longer exists. Well, that's the type of mathematics that we need in order to describe how electrons move if they're going to have these wave-like properties and have these quantized energy states. So how do we do that? OK, so this is where we're just going to postulate, or postulate. And what that means is we're going to say, well, here's an idea. And we're going to build things from that idea and then put in these conditions and basically keep moving forward until it breaks apart. Luckily, it hadn't broken apart yet. So bear with me on this. Um, there is no derivation. And there's arguments about can you necessarily derive the Schrodinger equation. You really can't. You, you start from it. So it's the first principle that we start with. So let's start with the wave function. Quantum mechanical equation of motion. So we use a, what's called a wave function, and that's given psi of x and t. So this is our wave function. And we're only concerned about the stationary states. For those of you who want to go on into physical chemistry, I hope all of you, um, time dependent, beautiful, but we're not going to do it. So everything we're going to do is just going to be psi of x. So this is the time independent or the stationary state wave function. OK, so there are some conditions about the wave function that we have to make sure that our functions follow. So just like this, this is a bad function. This doesn't work in calculus because of that discontinuity and because you've got multiple x values and you've got this, this sharp break. I mean, this, the derivative of that would be infinity. Um, so that's not good. So what we want to do is put in these um, specific restrictions on the wave function. So the wave function, it must, one, be continuous. Two, yay. No. Notice how it's not continuous there. So you need to have that wave function be continuous. Number two, have a continuous slope. So this means if we take the derivative anywhere of the wave function, it can't be infinity and it can't, well, it can be zero, um, but you don't want it to be uh, infinity. You don't want it to have an infinite slope, which would basically be like an asymptote. So d psi dx is continuous. 
So that would be, um, so an example of this where it would be bad would be, it's like a tangent function or something. No. Unhappy face. Okay, number three. It must be single valued, which means you can't have like six uh, values for one psi of x. Um, so in this particular case, you have x where it goes straight up and down. Um, that's bad. <laughs> uh, so uh, the wave function wouldn't do that because that would mean that for one value of x, you have multiple values of f of x. That's multiple values. Um, so it means it's not single valued. That's bad. So you don't want that. The other thing is you want it to be what's called square integrable. That's a fun word to say, kind of like asymptote. Um, so square integrable, put that to over here, four. What that means is you, if you take the integral of psi squared dx, it will be less than infinity. So if you, um, basically it doesn't diverge. And so if you can remember from your calculus days, um, functions can fall into two categories. They can either diverge or converge. So if you look at the, um, the area under a particular curve, if it diverges, that means that function goes off to infinity. And so if you took the area under that function from zero to infinity, it would be, it would be huge. So what you'd want is something to be square integrable. So something that looks like this means that it's not going to diverge. It's not going to go off into infinity. Whereas a function that looks like that is going to keep on going. So. That's it. Those, you have th those four conditions. So if the wave function falls under those four conditions, then you have a good wave function to start with. Cool? Okay.